just to um, uh, get loose, to kick things off, I, I do want to talk about my favorite tweet of the year. In fact, that's not even doing justice because I think it's actually my favorite thought like had by a human being this year, courtesy of Sheriff David Clark, who said... Uh, that's my added, sheriff right there. Yeah, he added Donald Trump on Twitter and said, Donald Trump should invite Justify to the White House lawn for winning the Triple Crown. <laughs> Justify is a winner like Trump who could care less about leftist identity politics. <laughs> Hashtag MAGA. For, any, for those who are not clear from the tweet, Justify is a horse. <laughs> uh, but aren't you, aren't, you sick, aren't you sick of those horses that love ID politics? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, hey. Mr. Ed, always like, yeah. oh, I'm an equine American Wilbur. Uh, hey, American Stay Farrow. out of equine spaces. Hey, American Pharaoh, shut up and run, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like most people, I watch horse racing to escape from politics. <laughs> yeah. And it's embarrassing that, yeah, every post-match or post-race interview, you get somebody talking about it. It's, it's so the leaving. least Wait. political sport, though, right? It is, because it's all run by these like weird Kentucky Habsburg guys. <laughs> yeah. like, these are, like, just horsemen. They either have too few or too many chins. Yeah. yeah. Now, the horsemen are all scions of like old slave money. They, they don't. They're not gonna let those horses kneel. That's yeah. not happening. <laughs> they they all watch a special recut version of Django that like ends when they get to Leonardo DiCaprio's house. <laughs> they. But the yeah, thing is it's like all well, on the same page, and all the athletes are like these tiny little muscular jockey men. So like it just it you know the the racial politics tends not to come up because well they all just agree in the back room not to mention it. Well, they're discriminating against the lowest race in the totem pole, manlets. <laughs> but they. Uh, I like the idea that it's like justifies the first um he's like the first like MAGA horse, like sea biscuit shit during the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> I was like this is absolutely disrespectful. Think about all the horses that went to Afghanistan. You're just doing this. <laughs> the ones who fought with the horse soldiers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We saw. Exactly. Yeah. They're yeah. not being invited to the White House. This flashy hip hop <laughs> athlete horses, though. Yeah, what do, the fuck? There's gonna be one of those like hockey memes where it'll be like, Why do you honor this? And it's like justify with flowers around his neck or whatever, but not this. And it's like whatever Michael Shane and on a horse. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want the every all the MAGA guys are gonna get into pit bull fights because, <laughs> because all of them sit during the national anthem. I do and wag their it, tails. It's, it's it's I give credit to David Clark for be will, being willing to really make the Caligula reference that over. Yeah. Yeah. You just don't have Trump on the White House lawn with a horse. You're drawing too many uncharitable. Uh, well, I mean sir, I, sir. Please marry your sister. We'll drive the liberals crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I saw this, of course, yeah, obviously I thought of Caligula, but I also just thought how badly I want this to happen. Oh, God, yes. And, like, yeah. how much I want Trump to invite a horse to the White House. <laughs> it's the only and, and have, like, a Rose Garden press conference and be like, folks, look at this horse. He's a winner. We it's can amazing. learn a lot from him. Folks, it justified. <laughs> How many jobs did I create since I became president? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, folks. At He's still tapping. At the, end of, at the end of the ceremony. All right. Well, now that your days are done, you're going to go to create more jobs at the glue factory. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, no, he's in his prime. He's like, no, I, I saw he walked to the lawn slowly. It was very disrespectful. <laughs> I've never been more insulted. <laughs> Trump would like ad lib fifteen minutes into his speech about justifies future and stud like just like <laughs> <laughs> folks folks his future it's going to be very bright well, believe me I've often said many said that that would be a good extra uh, career for me but I, I want to get into that yeah, because <laughs> I think like we're going to talk about the veterans because <laughs> we know how important breeding in is and justify obviously he's the, the best racer he's going to create so many amazing racehorses I am basically that of being president and of, uh, of having a brain, a smart brain. So honestly, if you think about it, that should be my job too. Trump caught on a hot mic uh, talking to the horse like it's a human being and being like, look, you're going to be, a lot of other horses are going to be throwing themselves at you. Let me, let me tell you a story about me, Gina Gershon, Larry Silverstein. <laughs> And Jeff Flake is like, this is absurd. The president met the greatest horse in the country, and this is how he's <laughs> This is what it's come to. Yeah, this horse is technically four years old. Did you talk to a four-year-old that way? <laughs> I do love the idea of Trump just becoming, becoming like the presidential stud. 
<laughs> and it is an executive time every morning. They just line up some uh, some uh, congressional fillies <laughs> and, and bring them in there. And at 250 grand a pop, he's making new business leaders, new presidents. <laughs> you are going to love my seed so much. <laughs> it's been ass. It's phenomenal. <laughs> I have been jelking. <laughs> Clark doesn't really do anything now, right? No, like he does not, nothing. He posts. Yeah. yeah. So, like, maybe a pivot to sports radio is not the worst. Like, it just, at least it keeps him off the streets for, like, three to five hours a day, depending on what station demands are. So, he's like, not... Like tooling around downtowns in a, in like tricked out dune buggies running over pedestrians. Yeah, right. Like trying to get someone to make eye contact with him so he could be like, "What the fuck are you looking at?" <laughs> like, just, he, I like. I hope he does like an NBA specific Colin show because that's like the only fan base that would actually like push him as much as he deserves. Oh yeah, like they're the best shit talking fan base by far. By far, football guys are just blackout drunk by like the <laughs> first quarter. Hockey guys are just pissed. Bunch that of like more people don't like hockey, or yeah. that like more people won't admit that yeah, it's like too, actually very hard to play hockey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're they're, they're, they're like too hockey, needy. The hockey people are too needy because they want you to yeah, like the sport. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the NBA people are brutal. Which means that if he did have a show, he would go to jail immediately because he would just swat everyone who called in. Oh yeah, him. I mean yeah, that's yeah. the part of it that would be really. Good. <laughs> I mean, you look at like how easy it is to to get through like the brief experience that Chris Christie had auditioning for <laughs> Princess oh, show. Oh my god! And it was like all these guys that usually just call in with like terrible Yankees trades. Like they all hated Christie enough that they were able to get through and it was like whatever like Jim from Parsippany all he ever does is talk about how like Aaron Judge needs to like grow his hair out or something like that <laughs> but like Jim from Parsippany actually also hates Christy enough that he was able to get through and be like what's the deal with your face and body and Christy, <laughs> yeah. and Christy was like oh real tough all right well you can't I actually look very good you know, whatever, like, and that was like half the show that he did uh slight digression on uh on, on sports we've been sports heavy lately but uh you know, I don't I don't follow hockey that closely, but I have been really enjoying all the all the photos of oh, Russian <laughs> snow yeti, fucking uh, uh, like the, like the yeah, Ovechkin, uh, just toting the Stanley Cup with him everywhere. It's like and just you're like, just watching him die in real time of beer, <laughs> like he's yeah. dying of beer, is, and there's nothing that can be done to stop it. This is the most significant cultural exchange between America and Russia. Because Ivichkin is just uh, creating spectacle everywhere he goes, being blackout drunk for what seems like three weeks straight. It's been at least yeah. seventy two hours. Yeah, and I mean, and like, it's like that is the Russian way of life. Just to be <laughs> in your be in your weird like combination boxer brief underwear <laughs> and blackout drunk all the time. But like Americans see that and they're like, That's us too. We're not so different. And it's like in a time of increased tensions, it's good that we could see we have a very similar culture. Did you see? Well, it's uh, the village politics sports. That's why everyone gets to have the Stanley Cup for a little bit. Where it's like, that's well, so this cool. week you're yeah. chief. It's yeah, very much. You know, it's very much uh, of of the old country. Yeah, and hockey is special to the Russians. Hockey and wrestling are special because it's the only way that you don't work in like an off-brand Radio Shack, which is where <laughs> everyone else works in that country. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, but uh, Adam Friedland he went to he went to college in DC and said he uh, he knew a girl who was this like sort of hot raver chick who uh, of, like of got gave Ovechkin uh, her number and he would text her things like uh, quote I want to fuck you in ass <laughs> very smooth <laughs> well played indeed there's I think that that's more common among athletes than. Like, like I would know. Like, I mean, that's not the type of sports rating I mostly do. But I know a woman who, I believe, is a rabbi now, who went on a date with an I will not name him a Boston Red Sox reliever who, when he picked her up, had like one of those like in dash screens that was just playing pornography when she got in the car, uh, and she was like, "Man, you gotta like at least mute that." Like, <laughs> and oh, wait, wait, it was playing sound. Yeah, too? And, she, and she was. And he was like, "What? It's love. It's beautiful." And she was like, "Man, like." You're, <laughs> Or not even getting dessert, but like. Gee, let's go I wonder why she became a rabbi. Yeah, I was gonna say like that. Was just going the oh, other. Oh, I know who you're talking about too. That guy's amazing. Yeah, his love of pornography was really kind of heartwarming. Yeah, well, it is. yeah, J.R. Smith, like famously, when yeah. that woman's like, "Hey, I'm going to your game tomorrow," and he's like, "Oh, damn, you're trying to get the pipe." <laughs> like, amazing. So cool. I guess it's like if you're that good at something, it, John Jones is. 
No, we, men don't need to be good at something to act like. That. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> It's just the ones who are good at something we know about it because yeah. people pay attention to them. John Jones, who's like the former UFC light heavyweight champion who pretty much will beat anyone put in front of him and is the only not champion because he tested hot for banned substances twice in like a year. Uh, one of his videos leaked and it was just him standing in like an empty basement using his pelvic muscles to swirl his dick around in a figure eight. <laughs> and it's like not even hot. I think it, he's just such a... This is a, tra a training video? Yeah, no, he was like... <laughs> sending to, he sent it to a woman. He's like, you make me such a pervert sometimes. And it's like, I don't even know if that's pervert. You're just showing off again. <laughs> I guess, that's, that's amazing. That's not, but like, that's, that's not really hot. That's not schedule, sexual. It's just very coordinated. Yeah. No, you, it's like you Talk just... Talk about core strength. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, he, because he's like, he's just... Trained MMA because he got his his girlfriend pregnant and was like, oh shit, I need to make money. And he was just so talented, he beat everyone and became a millionaire. I, clearly, he's talented. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he literally would win fights with things he watched on YouTube the day before, and with the dick figure eight. That that was probably the first time he ever tried that. Ever. <laughs> Some people are just gifted. Yeah. <laughs> so. I mean, we're talking about sports, so I guess this is a, a good segue into uh, this week's episode and uh, introducing our guest, in case you hadn't picked up on it already. It is returning champion David Roth. David, hi. Thanks for being back. Thanks for having me. So, um, you know, obviously you write about sports, and but you also write about, you know, politics and the crossover between the two. And not just politics, but like both in your tweets about him and your pieces on him for The Baffler or Deadspin, Trump has become sort of like a your Moby Dick, you know, like you're you're the Herman Melville yeah, to Trump's I, giant white whale. Half of that, I think, yeah. is a compliment. The other half is just unspeakably <laughs> sad. And but totally uh, you wrote his piece for Deadspin this week about essentially like the the, the the gateway into this is that like the NFL owners and this idea that like they just they thought they could placate Trump with this stupid half measure about, oh, you have to like be in the locker room if you want to kneel for the national anthem and just completely miscalculated who Trump is and like how he thinks and operates. Yeah. Or that they could, I think mean, just thinking that you could make a deal with him in the first place is like, that's the real failure. And then it was just the rest of its details from there. Yeah. Which is interesting because, I mean, as you kind of point out in the article, like when I think of people who should understand Trump and are like him, I would think of NFL owners yeah. first. It's the closest thing he has to a peer group in terms of like, like must be divorced this many times to <laughs> enter the club. Like just like rich guys that sit around all day getting plumper. Like this is, these are his people. And yet, but they did. I mean, they did fuck him over, right? He was, uh, they didn't, they prevent him from owning the bills. Yes. Well, so. kind of. Yeah. I, I mean, mean basically he didn't know what the details were, but, but I'm yeah. sure he probably may be in some, in some recess of his, congealing brain blames them yeah i think it goes back and this is something that i don't understand as well as i probably should given that i'm talking about him into a microphone right now but the i think the usfl experience that Trump oh, yeah. had has a lot to do with that too which was like he basically started and then ruined another football league that was like a successful league like it wasn't like an xfl type bullshit thing like big like herschel walker played there like jim kelly like Born they had like real stars and it was a rival to the NFL, and then he wound up just breaking it because he was such a turd, and that's what he does. It was like one of the, it was like a young Trump vision of what that would mean, so that he was actually like he succeeded for you know a year, but then yeah, he's been like really up in arms about the NFL owners. So that would be thirty five years ago that that yeah. happened, which is, makes it one of his younger beefs. But it is like definitely one of a long standing beef of his. Yeah, he just. He's very mad at anyone who sort of he perceives as having prevented his massive achievement. It would have been fantastic. It would yeah. have been amazing. I think if, if you, if you think about it and you really it. do hear it uh, more and more that so many are saying that <laughs> him buying the Buffalo Bills would have turned them into champions. Honestly, that, I mean, of all the alternate, like the ways that this could have gone that involve him not being president, him buying the Bills and then like trying to move them to Palm Beach or something like that. Like, that's the... I mean, any of those things are funny, but, like, that's the one that I, I think about the most. Especially because it's such a, like, sad franchise with all the, like, extremely drunk fan base, like, even by NFL standards. Like, it would be... Whatever, it's a powder keg. It would be hilarious. Well, you know, we talked about it before, but, uh, you know, like, the spectacle of him disinviting the Eagles to the White House and then putting on this, like, 
patriotic oh, day right. display where the he sing-along. half-hearted sung along to God Bless America <laughs> with the United States Army Choir. But uh, I, just, I, I have to read it. You, you had a, a great uh, tweet on this where it's, uh, you write, Trump on the White House lawn roaring with laughter like De Niro in the movie theater scene from Cape Fear as the Marine Corps band plays the Ghostbusters theme. <laughs> We're having a great time without the football players. Believe me, he boos. <laughs> <laughs> but um, like, like with there and then like with, with the, the NFL thing, what you get so well in the piece is like th- this is a perpetual issue for him and it keeps coming up and, and they, it's just the NFL owners can't deal with it. The league can't deal with it. It, it's an issue for him because it's a TV issue. It's something that happens on TV. and That upsets him. That upsets him because all he does is watch TV. And get upset, yeah. Yeah. And so if like, he, he sees you know, uh, something happening that he thinks is a reflection on him on the television, he'll get angry at it unless they're um, praising him for yeah. some reason. Yeah, I mean, and this is also the problem with having, I mean, uh, on a long list of problems of having this like hopeless shut in TV addict as president is that he's on TV all the fucking time now. And so he's constantly watching, constantly getting upset about like, it's not doing exactly what it is that he thinks it should be doing in reflection of him. But like, that's the loop. Like that's not, it's, I mean, whatever, there is actual stuff happening in the world, like in this country, terrible things, but he doesn't, I don't think he knows about it. I don't think he cares about it. Like, and it's not, I mean, that there's this whole other, like, community of belief of people that are just sort of kind of living the same, like, sick lifestyle. That's what I you mean, really get to in, in the article, in, like, in terms of, like, how Trump's mentality and, like, who he is as a person is reflected so perfectly in the people who believe in him. And actually, for the first time ever, I was just hoping you could actually read from your own article. Sure. Because, okay. you know... I think you should do it justice. So, right. could you just read the uh, the first I know highlighted for a fact, paragraph David does there? Readings beautifully. Yeah, this is the the last time that I wrote a piece about how terrible uh, Trump was. It was also the first time I met Amber because yeah. I did a, a reading for it. All right, uh, the president of the United States just fucking sits there and watches television all day long. In large part because he's on television a lot now. He's either pleased or displeased by what he sees, and he shapes his actions and more or less by accident the scope and tenor of our broader national politics in response to what he sees. Some unlucky but mostly invisible people suffer greatly as a result. Some even unluckier people might even die. They may be dying now. They may in fact be dying right outside, right now. But the program is in commercial break at the moment. William Devane is telling people at home about gold. An octogenarian former game show host, the color of a walnut, is explaining how a reverse mortgage works, kind of. And that's the end of that paragraph. Um, as I said when I, re- when I read this piece, I think basically it should be the law that you and maybe like two or three other writers should be the only ones allowed to do like lyrical essays about Trump and what it all means. I fucking hate doing them too. D- David Roth and Stephen March are the only people yeah, 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 allowed yeah, yeah. to do it. They're also brothers. Yeah, yeah, we get actually we get paired up a lot. Uh, we play squash <laughs> during the week. Uh, I mean, that hits at it because I think about all the... People in the last year love this, where it's like Trump will just uh, have a spasm, but, uh, like when he called Chuck Todd sleepy eyes, and someone will be like, this is actually a slur used against Jewish people from oh, Bear Sturmer in 1933, and it's like, he probably doesn't really have a clear idea of what the Holocaust was. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, like, like he gets that yeah. it was bad, but he's fuzzy on the details. Not good, yeah. folks. He literally, they took him to Auschwitz, and he's like, Wow. This is a pretty bad deal. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you'd think you'd think the Jews could have made a better deal. I don't yeah. understand yeah. it. Historically speaking, they're excellent deal makers. I don't know. If this is a huge misstep. And I think that there's this psychosis that goes on, and you see the same thing with Steve Bannon, where it's like people are still so shocked that he won that they have to create this mythology about him that he's constantly winking to old Nazi propaganda. Yeah, well, that's he, like a classic Democrat know move, he, too, right? Right, he like just you lose to some fucking oaf, and then you're just like, oh, that guy was actually a genius. Like, if well, you think yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's... Their ego is to believe that he's playing 13th dimensional chess and not dodgeball, which yeah. I think is actually... It, exa- like, he's just watching Brian Kilmeade for 19 hours a day <laughs> oh. and, like, and th- like watching the Property Brothers, and he's like, we could use those guys in the Middle East, and then just <laughs> says something about, like, the last person that criticized him. And it's... I think it's the equivalent of, like, 
some guy just like one shots you at a, in a bar parking lot. And you're like, yeah, that guy was actually like a pro fighter. <laughs> <laughs> at least like Bannon has the like whatever the dignity to be fucking high when he's doing that. Like Trump <laughs> knows like 200 words and is constantly like just in a state of sleep deprived like mania. So there's not the idea that like any of this is strategic or that any of it is like the outgrowth of some sort of calculus on his part. Like he's been doing the same shit since I was a child. Yeah, he has he, been. He tweeted more than one tweet directly at Robert Pattinson after him and Kristen Stewart broke up. It wasn't just like a comment or a joke. He he decided to advise. Oh yeah, he the put British his order actor in. Actor Robert Pattinson to give to give him a little guidance going forward. That's that's something that he thought would be a good well, idea. This is my favorite vision well, yeah. of Trump. Like the 2013 like live tweeting access Hollywood yes, version of Trump. Yes. Like it's just a beautiful specimen. Well, of- no, uh, you actually I'm I'm so glad you brought up the the Kristen Stewart Robert Pattinson thing because in those classic tweets and David you write about this, he uses one of his famous stock phrases <laughs> where he goes Robert Pattinson you got she'll, she'll cheat on you again like a dog. <laughs> like and the, he says the phrase "like a dog" is like the biggest insult to Trump, like because he's that, a Muslim. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually kneel six times a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but, but it, it, in the piece, David, you write about his conception of loyalty and how, like, to him, uh, to, the behavior of a dog who are famously loyal yeah. to to human beings is disgusting to him, or like. His conception of loyalty, remember when we did the Comey book and he asked, Comey said, I promise, sir, I will always give you, like, you know, my honesty. 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 honesty yeah. And he goes, yes, honest loyalty. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. But David, like, could, could you talk a bit about what you wrote about, like, how, how Trump sees loyalty, how, both how he sees it, but also how it's reflected in the people who admire him? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, for him, it's about service yeah. and not, like, the sort of, like, devotion or, you know, whatever, like, any of the Jim Comey visions of what service would be, which are like all, you know, again, it's the only vision dumb enough to lose to Trump. It's like that other <laughs> yeah. understanding of it. But for him, it's like, it's something that you you do for your boss. You're like loyal to, there's a, a Donald Trump Jr. tweet yes. that I come back to, the one about- Oh like, yeah, my, about the gr- groundskeeper. Yeah, like our greenskeeper missed his sister's wedding because- his daughter's like, wedding. His daughter's oh, no, wedding. wedding. You're right, sister's Jesus wedding. Jesus Christ. Yeah, he goes, he wishes his sister's wedding to work and he goes, love loyalty to us. To us, number two. Us. Yeah. <laughs> The little princeian oh flourishes for which Donald Trump Jr. is known. Tennis coach is getting sky buried with our grandmother. <laughs> I, love, I love people who really stick with us. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that like vision of, I mean, it's just about like what loyalty is complicated, right? And I'm not an authority on that beyond the fact that I like dogs and, you know, I've been married with the same lady for a long time. That like, but to me, the idea that it involves just giving yourself over entirely to your betters explains in part why the NFL protests would be disgusting to him because it's like the owners told you not to do it, you know? So like, why are you still doing it? Why are you being so annoying about the fact that cops keep killing people that look like you? Like, can you just like be nice about it? But like, I think that mostly it's about this idea of not to be loyal to him is to do what he says to do otherwise, to bother him in any way, to disagree with him in any way. Like that's not, fundamentally an act of disloyalty but it's the sort of thing where when you only when you see yourself as the top of a pyramid and everything else existing to support you then of course you need everything to be exactly in its right well, place he's a, he's a gelatinous weird. tyrant yeah. i mean like that's that's how he views things whereas i think comey internalized the exact same ethos but in a completely naive boy scout way where he expected um, the service to come with some degree of dignity. Yeah. Mm. What's weird about it for me with Trump is that, so he's been, he's been rich his whole life, right? He's been waited on hand and foot his whole life. I don't understand how, if you're like a small business fascist, like just like a normal Trump supporting upper middle class exurban person or suburban person, like what in that experience of his do you recognize in yours beyond the fact that you feel like you're owed more than you owe other I people? Think, I think it boils down to customer service interactions. Yeah. I feel like when they see Trump, their like their conception of a public space, like interacting with other people in public, what is it boils down to being waited on, and then wanting to get what you want, and then being outraged and annoyed by those people. Yeah. yeah. Those Donald Trump is a man who has lowers. sent back a steak for not being charred to crisp. <laughs> right. Can you cook this more? Yeah. 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 I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, like, fucking look at Yelp. Every psychopath on Yelp yeah. who are all complaining about 
service. I mean, these are these are the people, and that that's their only interaction with their fellow people for the most yeah. part. Is is it's a it is a transaction in which their role as customer gives them the sense of being God, and then therefore to have any kind of uh, uh, defiance of that is is infuriating. So Trump is just like. He is the Yelper in chief. Yeah. It's, it's the ideology of the suburbs. There's no public spaces. I yeah. mean, there's no reason why you would interact with someone socially or, you know, interact with the demos. What was that a uh, Federalist article that was like, um, don't say no problem to me when you give me. Oh, my yeah. God. And that it's, was, written uh, by, it's written by like, I forget who soft, wrote it. That's but it's, soft, by the way. Yeah, the, no, uh, not the not the Twitter guy. Is Schindler, isn't it John Schindler that wrote that? No, no, no. It was Radio Free Tom. Oh. Oh, oh, I always get those to be guys fair, so. I'm sure that sentiment has been expressed many times. You know what? I think I think we've just cracked the nug here. Like that is the common denominator among all the middle class authoritarians who support. Can Trump. I speak to your manager? Yeah. It, no, the people who get like physically angry when like someone younger or beneath them says the phrase no problem instead of you're welcome. Yeah. It like it, it just it, I'm your problem. It triggers something in their 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 fading boomer brains yeah. of just disrespect. And uh David, could you just read uh, one more paragraph from sure. uh, your piece here? Oh wow this is a really great paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> That's why uh, I highlighted it. <laughs> all right. Uh the people mounting the protests have made the same simple and humane point for years and have been answered only with the laziest umbrage and bad faith which is more or less the response that such protests elicit in America. But Trump also hasn't changed his broader position. He's not listening or learning or changing because those are not things he does. He is pushing and pushing and pushing at this issue because that is what he does and because he is nothing without something to push against. There is no compromise to make. Trump wants to become the world, to erase and expunge everything from it that is not him or about him. A generation of the worst and most hard-hearted people that this country has ever produced are lined up outside the church he has opened, and they are willing to leave everything outside in order to gain entry. It's the only way in. It's the only way there will be enough room. You picked um, yeah, some of the real, some of, like, of the uplifting ones. Yeah, the ones the, with but, jokes. Like, but that that, I, that vision of sort of like this suburban American Noah's Ark, and it's like that's the club. And we, as we were saying yesterday with the, like, the last show, we did this idea of like patriotism. And the idea that like it's always a mugs game that's being revealed now that is solely the province of like Matt said the the cruel and uh, vainglorious yeah. is that that like yeah this Noah's Ark vision they like they want to be in the club and anything that threatens like you know their ticket on the ark is like a huge threat to them and they have no problem leaving everyone else off the ark even if there's room because they don't have enough room that's on the, the ark the part of it that's so disheartening about i mean just like you know whatever like i don't want to argue that like twitter represents any experience of real life uh and i also don't want to argue that facebook i think represents it better but i think it probably does at this point the general tenor of it and like beyond the the cruelty that is sort of like baked into not caring about stuff like that it's that that absolute tunnel vision like narrowness of worldview that like it permits it opens onto any awful thing because it is basically like it begins and ends with like you and your own, your impatience at not being given what you want immediately when you ask for it. But like if that exists absent any other context, then like you will believe or apologize for anything. And that's the part of it. I mean, like I can't be, I, I mean, whatever. I love making fun of Trump because he's so stupid looking and such an asshole. But it's hard to, I mean, if I could write about him all the time, I think I probably would because I, you know, I do think he's a problem and I'd love to try to convince people or whatever, but I can't convince anybody of him. I know that certainly not anybody that, that cares about him. And also cause it's fucking exhausting to think about him for more than a few minutes at a time. Like, you know, it's just, that's the part of it that I think, you know, whatever, I guess because of the, the Bourdain thing kind of fucked me up some this week. Like it is an exhausting time to be alive. And it's largely because I think of just knowing that, you know, this is like a small, like a, narrow minority of a larger minority of mm -hmm. Americans in terms of the people who voted for him. But it's still like, I just knowing that they're out there, knowing that I grew up with people that, you know, like their parents voted for him just because they didn't give a shit. Like people I went to high school with voted for him because they didn't give a shit. Like that's a, it's a hard thing to like look people in the face knowing that when you consider what that actually means. Almost like harder to, to fathom for me. Like there are people who voted for him because they wanted to piss people off yeah, or because yeah. they don't give a shit. What is so staggering to me is the people out there who look at Trump and see 
an admirable figure, like a yeah. leader, someone who's accomplished great things. Right, that like that Ben that, Garrison vision of yeah, him. Yeah. Like, or that that like that he is a competent, uh, courageous and like intelligent leader. And cares That's about us. Really yeah. Because I don't know any of those. I know a few people who voted for Trump because they thought, ah, uh, what could you know, what what could go wrong? Or whatever, and they hated Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party, and they're like, "Well, let's try it. Let's try a new thing." I don't know anyone who thinks no, but he's just so fucking cool. But the thing is, I know that is a core of his votership is people that find him admirable, and I I don't know where those people are because I know Trump voters, but I don't know that kind of sucker. That I have somehow not run into that kind of rube. That type of person, you'll find them. You wouldn't find them in like. A lot of parts of Indiana, I think you would in like maybe Kokomo or Fort Wayne in parts. Kokomo is a dark place, yes. But you would mostly find them in like central and southern Virginia, places like that. Like it's Bill Mitchell yeah, I type think, people. I think it's riding mower dads more exactly. than any yeah. other people right, right. that I knew. It's, yeah. people, Mega it's, church it's people. the boomers who have had the easiest life of all boomers and they have have a unending supply of liquid capital because they like invented a new type of or they didn't even invent it their dad invented a new type of way to like shrink wrap meat for yeah, their little say, grocery like, chain like a pool cleaner that was later like withdrawn from the market <laughs> under yeah. shady circumstances it right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like yeah. but before 1995 you make a lot of money doing that right but but yeah it's it's that guy and i i just i never grew up around that kind of guy and i i think that there's like an underlying rage that they have where they, they're like, I don't get respect. I deserve respect. I'm a small businessman. I'm the backbone of this country. My riding mower is bigger than your riding yeah. mower. Like, and I, I think with Trump, they see someone who in their mind has received the respect that they are also entitled to. Yeah. 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 Well, That's I think my about, only theory. Yeah, my favorite Bill Mitchell tweet, maybe my favorite tweet ever is when he was fighting with like the more overt Nazis and he's like, oh, you're anti-Semitic. I'm 56 years old. A Jew has never stopped me from reaching my full potential as a human being. <laughs> and it's like, that's it. That's it. They're that not such like, an inspiring right, message. They're not like, they're not like <laughs> full long with like, they're not full long with some of the full, you know, full blown open racism as a lot of the people who voted for him out of spite and other things. But they're just like, their vision, everything in their view of the world centers around whether they achieve their full potential yeah. or not. Yeah. There's nothing else except how you did, how you were an asset to your customers and your stakeholders and every and your lawn and your pool. Because your wife hates you, your kids don't respect you. They're listening to rappers with facial tattoos. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Bill Mitchell is like Encino Man for like a type of boomer. Yeah. He's, <laughs> and if you want to understand this type of thing, it's so lucky that he has such a footprint all over the place. Like his his uh, Cora is still up there when he asks, like, why don't they invent a type of condom that only covers the tip? <laughs> <laughs> like it would save a lot of time. And but, it's like, that's it. That's, that's, that's the type of guy who just... L there are two types of people that just absolutely do love Trump and think he's admirable. And it's like the Journal of American Greatness type guys who are like, Trump is a re-manifestation of Charlemagne. He has the same <laughs> de desti destiny qualities. Or it's the most blessed of the boomers, the most ascendant boomers who are like, a Jew has never stopped me from reaching yeah, my full like, potential. And those are people that can afford to like, basically they're enough outside of politics because politics wouldn't necessarily touch them or any of the things that, you know, people get upset about and the culture wouldn't necessarily touch them, that they can afford to, they're just like, Trump is like fun to them or like funny to them. And so they're like, well, this guy, like he also succeeded in business, whereas like my, whatever, my father's <laughs> withdrawn pool cleaning product was a great success, you know, between 1988 and 1995, like so I can relate. And in all of those cases, it's just, there's fundamentally a very unserious understanding of what voting or like, caring or noticing things happening would be but i think that you can afford to be unserious with that because you're just like your number one issue in your day is like people complimenting your riding mower insufficiently 
Well, like there's the, the, the sort of suburban authoritarian is one semi like circle here. But in this Venn diagram of people who genuinely love Trump and think that he's admirable, another huge circle, and it does overlap a bit, is evangelicals. Yeah, that was Evangelicals say. love Trump. Jeez. And like that's why he has an 87% approval rating among Republicans right now. And I know we talked about this last time, but that's I was... That's just because we love an authoritarian. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And... I was thinking, I mean, we talked about it last time, but I was still thinking about uh, Scott Pruitt this week as like the perfect manifestation of like evangelical uh, dork. Yeah. Like, like all this, all, all these like controversies about him like send, sending his staffers to get him fancy lotions and mattresses and shit. It's just like living like some I, 19th century Duke in but DC. Like, but, but, all I can think of, but like, but not even that because what he's getting is like the shit that like is just like upscale consumer yeah. product like i was just thinking what a fucking rube this guy is with his challenge coins put the like siren his, on yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's just like you know, yeah, he, he goes from uh oklahoma where he's from to nebraska Nebra he's from, uh, no he's from oklahoma, oh, oklahoma right? yeah. okay yeah. he goes from oklahoma to washington he gets to be in dc and like you know just live like uh some sort of fancy guy now and like get all the good stuff and like but at the same time because of his, he is a diehard evangelical. He's in charge of the EPA, which just this week recently just classed an entire swath of carcinogenic chemicals as officially not dangerous yeah. and okay to like put in, you know, municipal water supplies or whatever. And like he's Gotta literally somewhere, he's presiding <laughs> over like the stewardship not of the apocalypse, which for them is fine yeah. because they believe that like. Ma well, man, but we think the, the apocalypse is a good thing. Well, they think the apocalypse is the good is a good thing, but also and that's that, like, why we have to tolerate the Jews. <laughs> yeah, but also, <laughs> or at that, least like, just don't let them stop you from achieving your goals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. But that, uh, yeah, we can despoil all of the environment and every natural resource, and it doesn't matter because we know, get a new one. Yeah, that God we're literally is literally going to get a new one right. when we're done with this earth. We'll and, that, and that, like, yeah, that God gave man stewardship of the earth, and that what that means is to literally extract every fucking resource from it until it is a burnt out husk. Like We're all right. and, I mean, wanna... it's their ultimate vision of of Earth like, and that concept of stewardship is like, oh, I'm Earth's customer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And this goes back to this Noah's Ark thing. Is that they're like, they're they're literally we're literally causing the floodwaters to rise. Couldn't be more pleased with it. Right. They just it, know. They just I mean, know they have a seat on that ark, and that's what. Literally, like, yeah. It's literally we. The apocalypse. The world is definitely ending, and that's definitely a good thing. That is written into what, like my grandparents believe. Although they didn't vote for Trump, they don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is the classic. They, they stopped. Yeah. They stopped voting after there was no longer um, a, a miners' union candidate. <laughs> The, um, but I, I always said that if I wanted to explain this kind of, um, you know, uh, evangelical nihilism, I would make a playlist, and maybe I'll actually do this, like a Spotify playlist of uh, songs that I grew up hearing in my grandparents' church. And they are all about how awesome it's going to be when the world ends, when we die, because they can't conceive of a place, and these these are poor evangelicals too. These are not the the bougie ones. They can't conceive of a of a time or place on earth where you're not in incredible pain. They it's just it's just not in their imagination. All they can do is just be like, but someday I'll die. It'll be great, <laughs> and that has shaped the entire like ethos of it. So of course, when there's no future, you're begging for the end. I, I, well, I, Scott Pruitt is no longer in pain because he has excellent mattresses and lotions <laughs> now. So he's he feels wonderful. Yeah, I, I, the, he's moisturized. <laughs> yeah. I think that like a big part of that evangelical mindset is it's sort of split in two. You have the poor ones and then you have the rich ones, and they both. It's weird. It's the only like kind of cross class belief system. They both believe the same dumb American dream, whether that whether it's working for them or not. Right, and. The sort of theological underpinnings of extremely harsh Protestantism, it it's the same thing for the rich and poor, but it means different things to them. What is like one of the core tenets of Protestantism as it was began? It was that we don't need as many clergy because it's between you and God. Like, yeah, you can have a guy who's giving you his sermon, blah, 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 but it's between you and God. No one's going to tell you what to do. 
And for it started out as an anti bureaucracy, anti hierarchy. Exactly. It, exactly. I mean, there's, right. there's good elements to it. Even now, right. like, that the Pope is like Martin Luther had some points. Right. 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 So, yeah. but for the rich, for the rich ones, instead of if you just look at that independent of everything else, you're like, well, that's a good message. It should be like this thing Something between you and, and what you feel. But for the rich ones, what it means now, what it has always meant for the rich ones, is like, yeah, no, I'm in charge. <laughs> I'm the clergy. Right. I yeah. get to decide yeah. who's bad. And my, yeah. my God knows my heart and knows right. that like I would never have uh, participated in a long running kidnapping scheme for bad reasons. Right. <laughs> but the lower ones, like the, the lower ones, their interpretation of it is like, well, okay, like less less people in between me and the end of this suffering. The lower ones buttress the the mega churches and the existence of the more rich evangelicals like the North Carolina evangelicals, the Virginia evangelicals, because you need this mass of millions of people who are like, yeah, no, I'm not going to, I don't have to like see another guy about what I have to do. It's not like going to the DMV or something. I could just listen to this man in a Hawaiian shirt. Dude. <laughs> right, I was like, give, give me what is basically a seminar about how to reach, be my best. Yeah. And the rich ones are like, well, yeah, thank you for kicking in. Uh, I'm going to listen to the same guy tell me about how I basically am God. But they you can see how a few centuries of market forces can turn it from something that like maybe did have a theology to just being like, again, like some dude in shorts using Bible quotes to prove that whatever Absolutely. you're doing is yeah. right. I, 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 <laughs> you know, it's more like, vulnerable I, to market incentives than anything else yeah, because right. it's a pr product of the modern American state. Right. I think about Rick Warren so much. Like Rick Warren is like, he's like the Spielberg of ev ev evangelicals. Like so much though, so that... <laughs> that could go a lot of yeah. <laughs> Well, I Be guess... Be uh, careful. Yeah. Uh, well, if Nick was here, he would say that. Uh, you know. But uh, he... Because I like, I'm fascinated by evangelicals. I watch a lot of like evangelical sermons on YouTube, and I like his because he's he so toes that line between mm -hmm. seminar and theology. And when he was up, that like I saw this one where he's like, "Now, when you're done with this course called Finding God to Be the Better You," and it's yeah. like this is just, this is LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. this is incredible. Like, well, like Scientology it, without the action, like as you move up the bridge, closer yeah. to your personal experience <laughs> of your savior. It's I mean, hierarchy. That's why Jordan Peterson is caught on. People say it's the self help thing. The self help people learned it from an extremely commercialized Protestant church. Exactly, and you know Catholics, you know a few things wrong there, maybe. <laughs> But there's something. There is something. A few sort of, bad apples. Yeah. A few bad apples. There is something a little bit admirable about how they still go in there and they're literally still trying to talk to ghosts or whatever the fuck they <laughs> yeah. do. It's still like at least there's like even the pretense of God here. Yeah, the but, United eh, States. Not enough snakes. Few, yeah. Not nearly enough snakes yeah. for my taste. <laughs> yeah. The the fusion in the United States of Protestantism, capitalism, and then just all of this land that this is here somehow, this yeah. giant continent full of land yeah. you can just kind of grab big chunks of. Easy no to mistake really, that for some sort no, of like prophecy too. Yeah, right? no one yeah. really, wow, it's weird. There's all this, where did everyone go? Like, wow, I guess I'll have some of it. Those three things combined this cult, created this culture of just absolute, uh, 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 a, a religiously infused narcissism that insists upon personal control and and is insanely violently hostile to any conception of limitations on your your ambitions or personal desires it goes further than that though like the idea of providence and the idea of like we have these things because god says we should have these things you can go back to the primary document of settling puritans who who had this exact from the start had this exact idea of like the bad things happen to us because God is testing us, and the good things happen to us because God loves us. And if you read, there's this fantastic, I think, um, correspondence or, or letter series that I read once. I can't remember who's writing it, but they were looking at the, um, the permaculture that the indigenous people had done. So there was like paths, and some things grew over here, and it's like, you know, you see any... Any people who have been in any place long enough have usually created a, a really elaborate agriculture system that interacts well with wilderness. So like rice patties in China or whatever. And they're like, wow, it's like God just made a path for us. Like it didn't take 50 years of controlled burning and tilling and stone removal and stuff. But what did the Protestants do after they gained from that? What did they do? They basically started the world's first 
Caddy fucking homeowners association, <laughs> which won the witch yeah. trials. They that did. was the witch trial. They did yeah. HOA, man. Yeah. Yes. Um, I heard you delivered a baby and it didn't die. Yeah. Nah, and and this is not keeping her yard mowed to the specific specifications. Burn her. It, it is almost an ancient tradition for these people to be fucking small business tyrants. It's yeah. amazing. It uh, absolutely the second is. they got yeah. here, they're like, uh, Read okay. Caliban and the Witch, small yeah. business tyrants. <laughs> <laughs> All I have is my name and my lawn. Yeah. Um, uh, Giles, the- Giles, Corey was crushed with stones because his his tall grass grew too unruly. <laughs> well, the, uh, they were tasteful flagstones from, uh, <laughs> well, from the Sharper Image catalog. The, uh, yeah, yeah, it was from like a Christian book. It was from like Brookstone. <laughs> Well, the, uh, the last thing I, w- I, w- I want to say about this before you move on to our uh, next topic is uh, Mitch McConnell said this week uh, that the first, like, you know, what, year and a half to two years of Trump now, he's like, this has been the, the, the finest time of my 16 years of government for conservatism in American politics. And I 100% believe him. Yeah. I think we should take him at his word exactly right. This is what conservatism is from... Colonists to now. Yeah, they don't have to pretend it like it's, it's just, anything else. Yeah, anymore. It, it is a just vicious and corrupt ideology that empowers the just cruelest and most callous people that this country has ever been capable of producing. Yeah. And Donald Trump is like the perfect avatar of it's that. It's amazing that they had to work so hard to cover it up for so long. Like, I mean, that's the only way that you could imagine. I mean, I don't think that that all or even most Americans are, are like this. I can't believe that. But I do think it's the sort of thing where they, the Republicans probably hurt themselves for a while by going and being like, you know, this is actually about, like, opportunity. It's actually about, you know, like, our heroic small business owners or whatever. When, like, really what they want to do is, like, point, they want to do, like, whatever the fucking Laura Loomer thing where you, like, see a brown guy and then you make a vlog about how upsetting <laughs> it is. Like, that's always yeah. actually been the thing. But they had dressed it up with this whole weird, unconvincing and inconsistent ideology of, like, like personal opportunity, small government, except for uh, like a massive police state, like you know, none of that. But I scanned, think they still buy this. like the Reagan fantasy con. It's just weird because Trump didn't really cater to that. Yeah, and I almost think it's just kind of in the air now. And they're like, yeah, he probably believes in all of that traditional Republican stuff, but he kind of skipped over that part entirely. That's the part that has always like Will was saying earlier about the idea of him as like an admirable guy. The idea that like you have to create this entirely different dude yeah. to like make it square with like what you because he himself is like he doesn't really believe much of anything to the extent that he believes. Well, you think know, about like, how many people actually think Beyonce is their friend. Yeah. Like yeah. we're living in a time period when people are more capable of projecting their values and their beliefs onto celebrities than ever before. And I think it's because of the hyper visibility and I think it has to do with like the speed of the internet or something. Yeah. So they're like, yeah, he probably meant that like he's going to keep my job. Yeah, yeah, no, you can you can it's there's so much information at, at your disposal at any one mind at any one time totally stripped of context and meaning uh, outside of just being just these floating little monads of 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 of, of content, you can make them mean anything. Yeah. You can, can you can construct them into a Jenga tower. The whole thing turns everyone into a want. conspiracy theorist. Yeah, yeah. You're, like you're we're talking starting about, yeah. within like a very hard to parse reality, and then you're just reverse engineering an explanation for it that makes like. And with Trump, that starts with the fact that the guy has a lot of money, and yet clearly, like, it's yeah. just his fucking mind is gone. Yeah, yeah. And he's only ever been like an access Hollywood dude. Like yeah. that's like 100 percent what he's about. Yeah, but, but we know he, he had place. the money though. He yeah, got it somehow. Right, so and so that means he's probably that good fact, at jobs. Good you at build business, everything whatever. from the fact the money. He, you can't argue with the fact that he's rich. He's a rich guy. Who cares that he sounds like his brain is literally <laughs> melting Seriously. as he's yeah. talking? You know, he sounds like his brain is falling out of his ears with every word. He's like yeah. fucking. Every sentence is like the robot at the end of 2001 getting the fucking <laughs> circuits pulled. Say, like a, and but he's got the money. <laughs> right. You're 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 hurting me, Justify. <laughs> I'd like to Daisy, say to you now, Justify. <laughs> um, uh, moving on from uh, from one president to another to a former president that I think t- does touch on what you were talking about, Amber. That everyone, uh, liberals and conservatives alike, everyone in our culture. They seem to think that celebrities and politicians believe what they do and are their friend because of the media. I'd like to turn now to uh, a recently released book that is a collaboration between uh, 
sort of airport thriller writer James Patterson and former President Bill Clinton. Best of both <laughs> worlds. Dun, 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 dun. So this is this is this is this is a new novel that is out now called I'm not I'm not bullshitting. The president is missing. Oh boy! And it's a thriller novel about a president who's the main character. And Patterson wrote this with Bill Clinton, and it's being advertised as a as a thriller that has inside details about the White House and the president that only a former president would know. Is the it pre- sounds like a children's pop-up book. Yeah. Is he behind the bush? <laughs> yeah. oh, no, oh, no, he's responding to a Black Lives Matter protester. <laughs> <laughs> you pull on a tab and Jeffrey Epstein's plane goes across ah! the <laughs> <laughs> Can you find the flight logs? <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So, the, so uh, in the New Republic, they did. Someone read this book and gave a very spoiler-heavy review of it. And friends, damn it, I'm here to tell you, <laughs> it is amazing. Like the ideology on display in this book, both as like a conscious uh, response to Trump in terms of crafting a presidential figure that is basically exactly like Bill Clinton, but is a stand-in now for like what the re- Patterson and presumably the readership of this book really wishes the president were actually like. So this is a uh, Josephine Livingstone in the new Republic read this book. And I just, I got to read Felix. This is like I, another thing like Sean Penn's book where at times I thought you were writing this. Oh, I should, you should, I should have read this before. I could have written some fake posts. <laughs> well, well, midweek, mid- yeah. mid- midweek. So just, this will give you a little flavor for it. So, do not ever test me again, Andre, the president of the United States says to the Russian premier. Now that the cr- yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's go right. off, dude. You tell him. Now that the crisis is over, oh, and stay out of our elections. After I speak tomorrow, you'll have all you can handle to keep rigging your own. Now get the hell out of my country. Get off my plane. <laughs> get off my plane. I'm using it for something. Get off, get off so, my friends. Look, we're, I, I wouldn't say friends. Here it is. You shouldn't be on this plane. Uh, so concludes The President is Missing, a new thriller co-written by James Patterson and Bill Clinton. It is filled with, quote, details only a president can, could know. Uh, a fictional president named Jonathan Duncan narrates most of the book. Duncan, like Clinton, is from the South. He's very concerned with election rigging. He hates Russia. He thinks the media is too polarized. He's a great friend to Israel. He's a <laughs> well, perfect <laughs> hero, liberal in his sympathies, but with the war and torture bona fides of five John McCain's. Five McCain's. That's so a he lot. crashed 50 planes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we use the phrase perfect hero a lot. Right? So uh, it says, this is not a subtle book. It clobbers the reader over the head with its prose and with its meaningful lines, such as, I know that most cops, most of the time, do the best they can. <laughs> yes! Yes! The President is Missing presents a benign fantasy of the presidency, an alternative universe where a Clinton- Clintonian figure not only op- occupies the Oval Office, but has also swarded the Ruskies. Until a gendered twist torpedoes all the fun. When it's a pre- there's a twist ending. Do the twist! Fun. The gender twist! <laughs> Wait a minute, is this, this a is- crying game? A gender yeah, twist? Say, yeah. like- so, uh, basically, like... Uh, the plot is the president finds out that there's a traitor in his administration. Worse still, he meets this couple that knows like a code word that only like top secret people know or whatever. Oh, like a, and, like a Q sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, cool. yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, sorry to bring so, that up. So uh, the couple alerts him that Suleiman Sindoruk, the nastiest member of a nasty but fictional group called the Sons of Jihad... Oh, I hate it when <laughs> Muhammad Quran from the from the Islam group does the something. The Sons of Jihad are poised to destroy the American internet with a virus. <laughs> oh, this is so 90s. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As the character explains, one of the great ironies of the modern age is that the advancements of mankind can make us more powerful and yet more vulnerable at the same time. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. That's like a really dark twist on the common ad that ran on top of the NBA playoffs. <laughs> you have more power You're in your fingertips. You're living in the future like we a... always dreamed of. Yep. He knows every <laughs> single word to it. Oh, I do. We do live in a society, though. It's like <laughs> we a do. So true, though. Yeah, this is... With AI, you can change the world the way you see the world. And with mixed reality, you can change the world we see. <laughs> our lives were so simple. We used to check our email. Now we have to check if data is turned as female. <laughs> 
<laughs> so That's, I goes throughout this book. The book ends with like a President Duncan gives a rousing speech to the American people. Then again, this is this is what we wish the president would say to us. I mean, I know I personally do. And he says um, he he gives a speech uh, where he states that we're still the leader of the free world. Uh, he talks about election reform, lead free drinking water in Flint, Michigan. That would be nice. Dreamers, climate change, the opioid crisis. And when everything's done and dusted, Duncan says he's even saved the newspaper business. <laughs> Quote, the oh mainstream God. media coverage from right to left has become more straightforward. Not so much because of my speech, but because, at least for now, Americans are moving away from extreme media toward outlets that offer a more explanation and fewer personal attacks. Yeah, that's what's happening. That's what's happening in America yeah, uh, Nearly 23,000 subscribers, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so check this out. So... In the book, the president is missing. The president goes missing because he knows there's a mole in his administration. Oh, interesting. And he goes undercover. Sort of <laughs> out and about. As He's only the most recognizable most person in the world. In the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he goes sort of undercover out and about among his subjects, like, like the kings of yore who yeah. would mingle <laughs> with the people. Oh, I love this. This, this is like a bubble of carré plot. <laughs> yeah. So he goes to a, a baseball game in disguise. <laughs> He's amongst- wearing the Macklemore Jewish oh, guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whom amongst us does not enjoy a heated dog? No, at Matt, listen to this. Basic Matt, ball this game. This man's breath Mr. reeks President. of pretzeled bread. Mr. President, here's all your shoe polish. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Matt, listen to this. So he goes undercover in a baseball game. Ordinarily, I'd be like a kid in a candy store here, he narrates. I'd grab a Budweiser. Or me in a candy store. (laughs) I'd grab a Budweiser and a hot dog because there is no finer beverage than an ice cold Mm. Bud. Mm. (laughs) Donald Trump has never drank a Bud in his life. Not seriously. That's why I hope that Bill Clinton defeats him uh, for president in 2000. (laughs) (laughs) Do you think Bill Clinton has consumed anything except for like grass-fed child blood <laughs> for the last, like, 20 years. So because of that, this is... Clinton, he's giving all his little... little. He's salting the broth of this narrative with details that only a Bill Clinton could know. <laughs> so he says, No food ever tasted so good as a dog with mustard at a ball game. Christ. Not even my mama's rib tips with vinegar oh, sauce. My God. I, I, I heal all the choirs of angels and the heavenly spheres coming down and saying at once, shut the fuck up. <laughs> God damn, so, what a fucking own. You're saying, yeah, my mom's home cooking isn't as good as a fucking hot dog <laughs> at a baseball game. This is like, yeah, this is You're sub- basically saying she's the shit. My well, mom's America is his true mother, so it doesn't matter if he insults that whore in her rib tips. <laughs> this is like sub Mike Huckabee pandering. This yeah, is it's like revolting. A- I hate the fucking <laughs> Southern yet, guy bullshit. It's oh. very I hate it. Easy to imagine this as like an as told to book, though. The idea of like Bill Clinton <laughs> just laying that out, and Patterson's like, "Slow down, slow down. I'm typing as fast as I can." <laughs> the idea of just being- like it's vinegar sauce. It is. Uh, it's hard to explain. But He's like, no, 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 James. Listen, <laughs> the number one thing I thought about during my presidency was how I just wish I could go to a baseball game and get an ice cold bud. <laughs> you but know, I, so uh, you you know how like people always said, oh, if only Hillary had the charisma of Bill. But it's like I'm now convinced that everyone just gaslighted themselves into thinking Bill Clinton yeah. was likable because this is so. This is the exact same thing as Hillary. Like he's literally like. There's nothing I enjoy more than watching an NFL style football yeah. game <laughs> with a classic Coca Cola cola beverage. <laughs> and it's like, what the fuck? Listen to this. I think it's one of those things where it was just the 90s and everyone had better drugs. So they're like, yeah, it's probably fine. Well, he ran against a 90 year old man who didn't know what a fucking check, a, a cash register was. Yeah. It wasn't like he had a lot of competition for charisma. Just, and then Bob Dole, who was even older and arm didn't work. I thought you were talking about Bob Dole at first. But you're right. <laughs> yes, those were two extremely old bad candidates. That's the thing. He ran against two just two mad deans from a from a fucking college comedy. I think he had. I think he had a skill, but it's like it, it's like a fastball in baseball. Like it's it's time limited. That like for a while he was able to like talk about these things, and it actually sounded like the words were just like like a good actor, like the way that it yeah, seems like yeah, they're yeah. making the lines up themselves. But then like once that timed out, it's like he doesn't actually believe anything. And yeah, so, like, what no. you get is this: the idea of being yeah. like a fresh hot dog, crispy, wet. And you're like, what are you like? <laughs> what is, like, none of this makes sense. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, like, what he believes in is is the same kind of uh, America that James Comey does. Amber, like, what you said about how 
essentially they believe the same thing about loyalty, but one is foolish enough to believe that it yeah. comes with dignity. Yeah. Listen to this fucking pandering in the book. Um, so walking through the streets of DC with fake eyebrows drawn on, oh, Duncan oh, takes okay, pity. Nice. Duncan takes pity that upon that's not weird. a that homeless <laughs> Gulf War vet, purchasing him a turkey sandwich and bestowing a kind ear upon his troubles. God, this is the man that abolished welfare. <laughs> God bless you, this military Tiny Tim says. Then he squeezes the president's hand with, quote, the still firm grip of a warrior. <laughs> hey, hey, sorry about how you can't access housing or therapy or anything, but like you're still, yo, you're my, you're, I think you're the bravest guy I've ever What met. really matters is that you listen to me for these last few minutes. Thanks so much. Yeah. I'm going to go back to my box. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put a firm still grip on my sternum so, can. Okay, so 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 like so you, so you get a flavor for this book, right? Where it's like, you know, uh Bill Clinton and James Patterson, like I said, are creating the president that they wish they we had. So Bill Clinton it's like I'm still the president. Of course. However, but so it's very much like pegged to this current moment and like there's this whole thing with the Russians where he beats them and puts them in their place and it's like stay out of our elections on Is that why they're like that now is cuz he did that to them in the first place in the 90s? Like you literally <laughs> Tried yeah, that, you tried that, that's fucking true. asshole. Well, they did, and the lack of reflection is pretty astounding. I okay. mean, anybody Mark, could, should feel guilty about about the role of the Russians and their specific, the, the, sort of the almost perfect irony of it, because yes, it was under Clinton that we decided we're just going to fucking strip Russia for parts. Right. And then what the hell? You've got a strong man over there who doesn't care about democracy? How'd that happen? What, they resent us? <laughs> what the fuck? Well... Speaking of uh, blue jeans are some of our best blue jeans. (laughs) Speaking of being unreflective, what I think is funny is that uh, so it's basically he's just going to recreate the Clinton 90s, including all of the bad shit Bill Clinton did that got him in trouble. Listen to this. The book ends with the revelation that the villain all along was feminism. (laughs) Yes. The following is a spoiler. Yes. So here we go. Uh, How could you do this? The president asked the traitor in his midst once he's figured it all out. The answer, when it comes, is a surprise to him. The traitor's face is twisted up in agony and bitterness, full of resentment. This is what she says. Says the man who gets to be president, she replies. Says the man who didn't see his political career tanked over one little mistake. Having nurtured a grudge against the sexist media for years, one of Duncan's closest advisors loses her entire moral compass. Alas, the things that women do to a president. It's a weird old clang, and even weirder that nobody in Clinton's camp thought it was weird. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Y'all mind if I go beast mode on Russia and me too? <laughs> yes. The villain of this book at the end is Russia, hackers, the sons of jihad, and Me Too style feminism. Who are just bitter because they got unfair media treatment, not any actual, you know, assaults or harassment from a guy who just did that on stop for 30 years. The magic of these guys, no one ever tells them not to do anything. <laughs> yeah, because I like, mean, like, what what blowback at this point is Bill Clinton going to oh, get? Oh, right, yeah. Like, I mean, what can like, they do to him? Uh, so he's just going to be like, so here are my issues. <laughs> Just yeah. lay them out for the world to see. Yeah, they can't fire him from going to Davos or whatever the yeah. fuck yeah. he enjoys doing. They can't fire him from like starting a charity with Chris Tucker that spell that sells like <laughs> a knockoff cheaper eye watch to Nigerian children or whatever the fuck he does. Yeah, he can't be fired from his wasting disease. I mean, veganism. Yeah. <laughs> why, does, why does he look like that? Why does he look like that? No one should age like that. Damn, Amber, Mr. That, President, what... looking hell of vascular. <laughs> Amber, that's why I can see your ear vein, you disgusting freak. Die. <laughs> so weird. That's why all these little known personal details about rib tips. And, uh, and hot dogs. dogs. He's thinking yeah. about all that when he used to eat that. Yeah. Now he just has, he has to subside on uh, cheese pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that is the James Patterson Bill Clinton collab. The president is missing. Maybe they'll, maybe we'll discover some future chapters from the president is missing. We'll see, we'll, we'll, who's to say? Read them who's on a future to say show. If somebody got a big shiny Did they new... find the president? <laughs> <laughs> still, the president's still missing. He was That's doing, he was doing was like, you, you won't believe this. The president is missing again. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing... I hope this gets adapted into a TV show so that all across America, everyone can say, "That's the president." Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing. I'm doing a, a sequel. It's called President Finding Himself. The president's gap year. 
You're just rewriting transparent scripts with Bill Clinton. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, damn, we finally got an unproblematic guy in this transparent role, Bill Clinton. <laughs> so I don't have uh, anywhere to put this, but I'm just going to say it. Don't tell mom the president is missing. <laughs> <laughs> stop. Or the, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, stop or the president will shoot. <laughs> Adventures in President. <laughs> Demolition of Me Too, man. <laughs> I'm just really sad that Rodney Dangerfield is no longer with us to adapt us into the treatment it, it needs to be. <laughs> oh my God, yes. It's perfect, right? It's it would be it would be a um, a back to school style caper, you know. Yeah. There'd be a fun, like snazzy son, like Dad. You can't. You're the president. You know exactly how it would go, and it would be a, it would be an absolute hit. Hey, just, like, hey, just like the Rodney Dangerfield films, the villain at the end of the movie will be some fucking bitch. Yeah, some <laughs> fucking bitch. So, yeah, some uptight bitch who gets mad that I don't know that men are having fun and yeah, being yeah. the president. Hey, hey, Vla <laughs> hey, Vlad. Only type of call, only type of hacking you're going to be doing is if you smoke some of this fine Colorado medicinal. <laughs> So moving on uh, to to round out today's show, uh, which has been a which has been a barnstormer. I I have to do now for the reading series for this show. What is, in my opinion, maybe one of the maddest things I've ever seen published outside, like the newsletter of the Bedlam Asylum that's written by its <laughs> patients. This is in the Atlantic, and I got to shout out uh, Brandy for blowing this up on my timeline just this morning. Yeah, like it published today. And today it's already, I and feel like it's a classic. already. Bloody legend, man. Yeah. It's already a bloody <laughs> legend. This is by Peter Wayner, and we'll talk about him because people have sort of dug into where this guy's backstory, which it'll become more obvious as this goes on. Is but... it similar to the backstory of Samuel L. Jackson in Unbreakable? Because that's <laughs> like that's the only backstory I can see. For this, this is guy. Uh, this is in the Atlantic, published today. Uh, headline: The New York City subway is beyond repair. Okay. Mm. It is a problem. Mm. Subways are getting worse in New York. Okay, so this guy's pretty guy has, bad. This guy's a solution. The subhead is forget trains. It's time for something radically different. And who boy yep. is this guy not afraid to think yeah, outside he raises the box? Stakes right out of the box, and it's whatever. It's so, it's a masterpiece of its little genre. So okay, I just have to read this. Yeah. So he he writes here: uh, the New York City subway is a miracle, especially at three a.m. on a Friday night. But the system is also falling apart, and it's going to cost billions to keep the old trains running. Nineteen billion, at least according to one estimate from city planners. The time has come to give up on the 19th century idea of public transportation and leap for the autonomous future. Right now, fully autonomous cars are rolling around Pittsburgh, the San Francisco Bay Area, Murdering and people. parts of yeah. Michigan. By the way, they're not fully autonomous. There's yeah. still someone in the driver's seat of all those cars. And the estimates are that they have to take control to prevent a crash every mile or so. Other than that, they're completely autonomous. Yeah, they're great. They're completely autonomous. So he goes, instead of fixing the old trains... Let's rip out the tracks and Whoa. fill the tunnels mm. with fleets of autonomous vehicles running on pavement. Yes. The result would be radical improvements in throughput while saving money and increasing the ability of the system to survive a fire, flood, or terrorist attack. What? Okay, DJ, huh? run that back. <laughs> in case you missed it, he is advocating pave ripping out all the tracks of the New York City subway system replacing them with pavement and basically making underground highways that will be filled with thousands and thousands of autonomous self-driving cars. Listen like to this. Like if that fit how many people? One. Yeah. Well, it starts well, it awesome. starts it, star, it starts awesome. with cars. <laughs> this is what's so great about the piece though is that it just it builds and builds it, it, and refines Amber, itself. It just, yeah, like cuz it like, starts where you're like, "All right, well then yo, let's My man part does two. not know math. Yeah. So check this out. It goes uh these subterranean highways would be dramatically simpler than public roadways for an autonomous, artificially intelligent system because the tunnels could be limited to authorized vehicles only. No jaywalkers on cell phones, no babies in runaway carriages, just a collection of competing fleets, centrally orchestrated and offering different levels of service to different groups at different prices. Folks, I know it's sort of a hobby horse here on the show. We're often... Our presented with the question, what is neoliberalism? <laughs> Folks, this is the answer. If you want to imagine what the most liberal neoliberal future would look like, let's continue. What if it 
it was expensive, completely impossible, <laughs> mathematically, and horribly inconvenient. <laughs> like the most dystopian thing you can imagine. See, these are good but questions. What's the perk? I want to find okay. what the thing well, is supposed to be better. Well, Amber, you mentioned Amber, earlier saving... that it actually saves money, so think <laughs> yeah, about yeah. that. Amber, savings in time and energy would come from replacing extremely heavy trains that stop at every station with lightweight vehicles that depart immediately and go directly from A to B, stopping only at one's destination. No more waiting or stopping every few blocks. Well, Prices right. could be... Don't, don't ask questions, Matt. Right. We'll, we'll, we, can, we can confront how the system will work, but let's just, let's just consider some of the perks. Because they'd all be in a line. So Prices can't. could be flexible, <laughs> adjusting to congesting and smoothing demand with a reservation system. So again, another very important feature of this is that uh, it will be really expensive and it will be you, you, different tranches of payments based on you know, uh, what you can afford. So maybe, so maybe like the lowest level, your autonomous self-driving car won't have seats. Right. You can make reservations, though. You can make reservations. And it goes, check this out. Some cabs could be upholstered with the finest leather and plated with gold for those New Yorkers who want a truly luxurious experience. Yeah, those people will not be down in the uh, <laughs> underground tunnels with the hoi polloi. <laughs> They're just going to be on their helicopters. Yeah. Listen to this. Others could have a work table for those who want to write on the way to the office. Trendy models you can do that on the subway. <laughs> Trendy models might come sporting graffiti designs by name brand artists created as an homage to the 1970s era trains. But most would probably be slim, simple, and utilitarian. People would pay to reserve a slice of the pavement at a particular time, and the tunnels would be maintained by these fees. The prices would move up and down, adapting to demand. The new system could be dramatically faster. The autonomous vehicles would take passengers from their initial station to the final one without stopping once. The stations would have to be redesigned, outfitted with little entrance and exit ramps that carry the cabs, which carry the riders up to where the turns I just, I want to, I don't want to interrupt. This person is eight years old. He's eight years old. Yeah. This How is what a child, this is a public transportation system designed by a child. Yeah. This, this was, I, when we were talking about this earlier, this is what I said, that this sounds like my nephew, who's six, and I'm going to go see after this, would and absolutely then, come up with this, then, but then like halfway through, would be like, uh, like, I don't know, like, <laughs> how are you going to, there's too many scooters, like, it's not going to work. This I, would only cost... Thirty-six trillion dollars. <laughs> well, that's, that's the insane I know. thing. I know. I actually. I, I wouldn't mind because I'm. I'm so. I. I. I know. I. I this. This. This beautiful child uh, has inspired me. I. Uh, to. I want to do some engineering math. Like I. I literally want to. I want to look at the capacity. I want. I want to figure out exactly what this would physically look like. How much it would cost what the speed would be. I'm going to figure out um, traveling for peak hours. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm in love with Amber, this. Imagine this guy is like a, a, a Charles Fourier uh, <laughs> level uh, utopian psychotic. This guy is going to be the villain of the new Bioshock. <laughs> I mean, why, I, this why is this like guy's thinking, a, he's thinking small. Why not just have personal balloons yeah. where you strap one of those old timey, you know, hot, like a personal hot air balloon that you strap on and then you take it to your location, and then when you get there, you like tie it off. Matt, like a I think horse. This, this is a, this what is, like, is, a, what is this, the number one problem in the city with transit systems? Not enough space. Yeah. Where is there unlimited space? The, the sky. sky. Yep. <laughs> this is like the type of thing that like the Italian neo futurist who just woke up and sniffed a rag soaked <laughs> ether every day would think of. <laughs> I will say that also yeah, where it's like their their designs hinged on like whether you would see an Albanian or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> bad humors and yeah. like, and just whatever like whatever degenerative brain problem you get from doing ether every day <laughs> this fucking rocks but yeah i agree he needs to dream bigger than the dream bigger than his 36 trillion dollar public private partnership again i want imagine if you're on your solitary car that this asshole invents and someone just somehow boards it to do showtime for you <laughs> <laughs> Again, I'd like to state that at the beginning of this, he said that this would be a cheaper way to no. fix yeah. the subway. He said no. billions of dollars. <laughs> this is the, <laughs> the, yeah. That's yeah. the thing that does make it super neoliberal, is the idea, we could spend $19 billion to fix the subway so everyone can ride it, or we could spend twice that to create an insanely complicated <laughs> system that makes a bunch of people rich and use and is accessible to vastly fewer can people. Can you imagine yeah. it, though? There's, there's, literally, there's literally no ride-sharing. 
Yeah, no, like, this there is, would this be... is fundamentally an, 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 a misunderstanding of what makes trains fast. And you would destroy you a lot the of city. On no them. one yeah. would be able to go anywhere. People would the first time it launched, someone would be uh, people would start dying after being in a forty-eight hour traffic jam. Yeah, this is. I like how every idea that's worse he, when he raises the ante. He's like, and here's the best part. The prices would change every second. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, every, every yeah, new yeah. paragraph, there's like a thing about it that makes it worse and more. This is what I respect about it. Like lottery. obviously, we we all agree yeah. that the idea is very good. I think yeah, that's what yeah. I'm hearing. Yeah. Perfect. But We're also, the literary expression of it is fucking perfect and beautiful. Not just my favorite, the one that I was reminded of that just there. The idea that there have to be little ramps to help you get up out of there is <laughs> <laughs> like, beautiful. Like that's like the Richard Scarry bit. Like there's yeah, gotta be like yeah, yeah. it's gonna be shaped exactly like your scooters. You can go right up. But it is. It's perfectly like just bloodless. Like he's using the right words. Like throughput is the word that you use if you're writing about the subway, what which is he's this doing guy? sort of. He, is he a civil engineer? No, no. Check Did this he do out. his PhD he, thesis uh, on he, Richard he, Gere's of, busy town? What is the he, fuck? Is he one of like the Green Lantern's enemies? Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, like what? What this guy's actual deal is? I'll skip to the end. Rick gives his bio. He goes. Peter Weiner is the author of almost two dozen books on technology, <laughs> theater, and the cars of the future. Oh, he's insane! Yeah. So no, no. As as I, when I read this, this guy is like sort of the dark gothic inverse or twin of the charming and harmless train enthusiast. Yes. He wants to destroy all trains. Hey. Uh, you know what's pretty good for a public transit system? Um, one in which one car can fit about 300 people and transport them on a series of tracks to a number of stations that will get them close to where they want to go. How about instead of that, we ha literally have, instead of one car with 200 people, uh, 200 autonomous self-driving cars, underground New York. It, not, that's just one subway car. They're yeah. tiny, and they well, have they have like a they all have to have their own separate power source size. Yeah. Yes, well, the that's New York City subway system services roughly six million people a day. <laughs> That would be have to be there would have to be roughly seven to eight million autonomous pods on the underground highways under New York, and he is saying that that quote the traffic would always be flowing, it would never stop. Well, that's, 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 that's true. Off and off, sure off, off and on, all day, all <laughs> night. I mean, my God, it'll, it'll be, be beautiful. beautiful. I mean, what what has helped New York more? Than the last time that you guys built a huge, complicated highway system. <laughs> what like, made yeah. the city Yeah, but what better. you guys are forgetting, you're like, oh, you have six million people a day? Yeah, but a lot of those people aren't going to be able to afford it. He's, so he's, they won't be on there. See? He's smart. He's not even Judge Doom, though, because he doesn't even under... It's There's no... And, I mean, there's privatization ambitions to it, but he's like, well, what if we just did this? Like, he's he believes in this. Yeah. He believes in it. And as it goes on, eventually, like, the autonomous thing, at like, first, you're like, all right, so there's cars driving around. Eventually, it becomes clear that he's talking about, like, hoverboards. Like, the yeah. things you see, like, terrified-looking 15-year-olds riding down I, the I, sidewalk. I need, I need, there is a lot more to this. I mean, it's, like, hard to process how much genius is going yeah. on here, but there are a couple, few, a few other things that we have to discuss. He goes, says here, the first elevated trains... Train lines were started in the 1860s, and the first subway tunnel opened at the turn of the century. He goes, in that era, the tech of choice was the train, and the trains were big. Autonomous vehicles, by contrast, can be an incredibly live, <laughs> especially if you skip over the car-shaped models and head for super lightweight transports called hoverboards or scooters. These clever devices with computer-driven balancing look a little bit like skateboards, but carry enough battery powers to go for a dozen miles or more. So everyone is going to be commuting to work on underground highways on hoverboards. This man is eight years old. <laughs> Wait a minute, hoverboards? What happened to the, the thing with the desk for writing on? I thought it would be, well, those would be standing on a hoverboard, like writing out a fucking memo? It's a standing desk, like Ben fucking Franklin. <laughs> he goes... Putting millions of Where people... Where are you putting the gold and, and, and the inlaid furniture, the, the beautiful... Those are bigger ones. Those are for better people. You Where's get the my... brown... You're in the brown group, so you ride the hoverboard, and those people drive over and or I around you. And I ride one with a humidor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> putting millions of people on cabs and hoverboards would require cleaning up the tunnel walls, mm. adding nice lighting, <laughs> and replacing the tracks with a smooth, paved road. There will undoubtedly be obstacles... Cleaning yeah, up the I walls and removing the old track will be difficult and costly. Eh. 
Some of the sections have right. double tracks that would cost twice as much to remove. Oh, darn it. Even so, a budget of $8 million for each of the 224 mi- 240 miles in the current system would add up to only $2 billion. Even if that cost were to double, that would still only amount to about one-fifth of the current estimate to repair the system. There will be other costs, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. To, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the amount of uh, insurance the city will have to take out for all the, the death by hoverboard. <laughs> the the uh, 240 miles of LED lighting would cost millions of dollars, but installing such a system would have side effects that would make them worth every penny. You ready for this? Rats, after all, hate the light Boom. and would be pushed to find new underground homes. Okay, his understanding of math is bad, but I cannot forgive his total misunderstanding of animal behavior. So he's saying we're gonna we're gonna make all the tunnels smooth, brightly lit, gorgeous. But an added benefit of that is that all the bright lights will drive the rats elsewhere. (laughs) It's the best. For one thing, it's such a good to be sure paragraph that he actually has to break it down into like three or four paragraphs. But every stupid article like that has one of these things where it's like, you know, to be sure, like genocide does have its downsides. But like this is like the things like, you know, you're doing a good job when the end of your to be sure thing is like the rats will, of course, have to find a new place to live. <laughs> like, you're just like, where are you? Like, yeah, there will be a, a, a up three here? to five year yet rat human war. That's just an <laughs> obviously. Anyway, signing off, Dr. William Gohl. <laughs> uh, he, he goes on a, a bit more. I'm just going to I'm going to skip to the end here. He goes. I think uh, he specified LED lights. The biggest like advantage. He wants it to be like cosmic bowling. Well, that'll be a lot of fun when I'm when you're standing on a hoverboard going <laughs> yep. from Times Square to Burl Hall. This guy just loves Tron. Like that's basically yeah, that was yeah. where it started, yeah. and likes, then from there, yeah. like worked his way back. So he goes. The biggest advantage of cleaning up the subway tunnels isn't fiscal, but the fact that New York's underground would become safer, making it possible for people to walk to safety in case of a fire, flood, or terrorist attack. Right now, people are pretty much stuck in a broken train, like spam in a can. This is a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. Yeah. The New York City subways, they may be intolerable at times, but they are safe and efficient. Well, for the where most are you but going, also, he's though? like, it's not just the budget that it makes it better. His budget is insanely too low. Oh, my like, God. He's, yeah. he's That's... like, $8 million a track. Like, what wait, the wait, fuck wait, wait, are I love you that. talking and that about? Was, and it's not like footnoted or anything. That's like he started. He's like, well, how much does like a decent fourth starter cost yeah. a major league baseball team? All right, so how figure that's a mile a track. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're just like... But wait a minute. How, uh, so if there's a problem, he's saying, oh, you can just go. But where are you going? <laughs> Are you going up the little ramp? <laughs> the ramps. How Matt. steep is the ramp, though? The ramps. But how steep are they? Well, like, they're, so they're imagine, little. Because like, if they're like very, very, if they have a very low grade, that's going to be a lot of tunneling. So are, are they spirals? Uh, <laughs> like obviously the nightmare scenario, you know, terrorist attack on the subway, some sort of Alm Shinrico gas attack on the subway. Now it would be horrible. People would be trapped in train cars, and they'd have to go to the next stop rather than go up a little spiral ramp onto the street yeah. immediately. No, in his, in his ideal scenario, if there's a fire or, God forbid, a terrorist attack, again, it would just be um, five million people on hoverboards <laughs> trying to go underground, the the clawing over each other yep. <laughs> to get to one of the thousands of exit ramps. <laughs> one way to work around that, though, would be if you built, so assuming that this works, so you do this, what if there were then another tunnel under it that was for people that... Uh, that you know, like had nicer scooters, <laughs> right? And then that could be like safer, and that incents people to make more money, get better scooters, totally. go to the other one, and then eventually you can continue going down eventually, like pretty much indefinitely. So he goes, creating an open marketplace for autonomous fleets would encourage innovation and evolution. He's talking about what would happen to the rats. Yeah. Like, get <laughs> oh, yeah. More intelligent. Oh, uh, they're already half as big as me. I, I give it three years before they're Felix sized. Per- <laughs> Perhaps the public would like fat, overstuffed chairs on wheels in some years and what? tiny hoverboards in other years. What are you talking about, dude? Like, so he's imagining some will be on hoverboards. Some will literally be whizzing through these underground tunnels in a giant automated barca lounger, just like that, with a big comfy chair. In the afterlife, I get to choose what everyone's trolley looks like. I love planning new public private transport. It's even better than getting my rocks off with a girl. <laughs> Like standardization is how mass transit works. This that's guy, what makes it viable. Is the standard well, 
what, this, uh, what this article posits is, what if that weren't the case? <laughs> so like, we just, what if we didn't take any of the advantages of mass from mass transportation? Yeah. So it's ending here, he says, um, who knows? Competition would ensure that the fleets adjust to our tastes and the seasons. Why? What the Why fuck does it are have you, to? What the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? So, our season, like, oh, I'm in the special winter scooter. What the fuck are you talking about? This guy has. What does he think the trains are like? This is, the, I think, the thing that's best about the story is I don't believe that he knows. Like, I don't think he's ever been on a yeah. subway, let yeah, alone this. No, no. way. And look, the New York City subway systems are uh, inhumanly bad uh, compared to literally, I don't any know. Any foreign capital. Any, yeah, yeah. any foreign country. <laughs> but also, they are uh, an engineering um, like feat for the ages. And, and it's just, there's a reason why the top of the line shit is now better trains and not little hoverboards. Like... I don't know why he decided to go backwards. Because this guy, as I said, is the enemy of trains. He just hates trains, even though they are far and away the most sensible and efficient way for moving large amounts of people throughout a city or a country. He's too libertarian to live. <laughs> well, well, that's the thing that I find so interesting about this article, because you, know, you can find insane screeds about public policy anywhere you want on the internet. They fucking publish this shit in the fucking Atlantic. This is the house paper for neoliberal yeah. conventional wisdom. That's the part so, of it that kind of blew me away with it, too. Because like, this is clearly an edit. You know, more than one editor read this. Yeah. Thing. I looked at it and was like, well, all right, like, good. Actually, that semicolon's in the wrong place. Like, how do you, why are you the website that publishes this? Like, it's one thing if you're like, Newsweek or like one of these things where you're just like hanging on by your fingernails. Right. Like it's the, you're the fucking Atlantic. You can always say no to like the whatever the Batman villain that hates trains. <laughs> like it's not hard. But but it's like well you lose me with the uh, the rats being scared of 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 uh, light and the bark the barca loungers and all that. That's kind of goofy. But you really got me on demolishing a public good. Yeah, yeah exactly. And replacing and that's one of the, it yeah. with a, a privatized um, uh, 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 system that is. That your access to depends on your ability to pay for it. That really yeah, got that's me. It's no longer give me liberty or give me death. It's give me capitalism or give me the worst fucking public transportation yeah. system I could possibly imagine. Yeah, one of the few paragraphs that uh, that Will did not read of it is him talking about how like the, with the lighting, this opens up new opportunities for advertising, oh, which could now be ubiquitous very... throughout the tunnel, so that your entire experience is just like you're driving by a billboard that never ends. Think Hell about yes. which is first week estimates. How many people would die? A million. <laughs> like, yeah. like, like, I can't a, wait to be decapitated while looking at an ad for Casper fucking mattresses. Uh, it, would, it would be like the Hindenburg every day. Every day. <laughs> oh, oh, by the way, uh, the, uh, the, the, new sub, the new subway will be run on a pneumatic g gas system powered by hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> Smoking will be allowed. <laughs> we'll set, you can set off fireworks in the subway now. It's just it's whatever taste we have as a feeling or as a person will be individually specialized to you. The last paragraph here. The 21st century deserves new ideas and approaches that take advantage of everything we can do with computers and artificial intelligence and robotics. We don't need to stick with our old tech when we can dream something newer and smarter. We don't need to stick with our old tech. See in hell, folks. <laughs> we don't need to stick with our old tech when literally the dreams of a the diary of a madman can now be substituted yeah. for the largest mass transit system in America. You don't need your old out of date meat body. We can just put your skull in a jar with a brain. You can just be a brain. It'll be so much more efficient. Long live the new flesh, folks. So, yeah, that is Peter Weiner, enemies of enemy of trains everywhere. Peter Weiner, come on, Chapo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Peter Winger star in Unbreakable 2 as the villain. <laughs> so, uh, lastly but not least before we leave, another article that came across our Chapo newswire literally right before we started recording that I have to shout out from salon.com. How LinkedIn turned this, quote, fail mom into a socialist. A dismal job market and Chapo Trap House turned me, a middle-aged mother, into a radical. This is by Lori Barrett. And shout out to Lori. Shout out to Lori. Lori. It's a very nice article. Yeah. Like, it's a very heartwarming article about this uh, mom, like, bonding with her kid over the show. And it's like, 
Makes me feel bad that 75% of the show is like us being like, call me doo-doo because I'm shitting on <laughs> <laughs> So, no, yeah, as Felix said, um, this was actually a really sweet and nice article about us in, in Salon and a, a mother and a daughter coming together over their shared love of a, a, a vulgar irony podcast. <laughs> so, again, shout out Lori Barrett and her daughter and the fine folks over at Salon who chose to put LinkedIn in the headline of this article, even though it's entirely about us. That's definitely yep. Amanda Marcos. <laughs> Someone's got a little problem with that. They wanted to keep us out of the SEO, very obviously and shamelessly. But David Roth, thank, thank you so you, much David. for Thanks, joining buddy. us. Thanks for having thank me, you so much for your uh, wonderful writing, which I appreciate we all enjoy it. very much. Thanks, guys. So till next time, guys. Bye. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Bye. Y